whether you are new to constructing or a lifelong veteran. We hope this video serves as an entertaining way to learn more about the construction process. Even if you aren't building a great Western building, most of the procedures will be similar or the same for any metal building. If you have any personal questions or can't find the help you are looking for, don't be shy. Reach out to our free helpline. Let's begin. We're up in Floresta, Colorado, just up the mountain from the uh, small little town of Crested Butte. Uh, we've actually put a building up here before, a few years back. Um, we'll put a link to that in this series, uh, just so you can see that other building. It's, there's not much there, it's really just a time lapse. Uh, but since we're up here and we're working for friends, we thought that uh, we'd bring a small crew with us, help them put it up, and, and do a video series on this. Uh, we've tried to do this in the past, uh, but really we're never able to get around to going over each and every detail so uh, today we're going to start filming and this is all going to be instructional it's all going to be how to and we're going to get a lot of tips and tricks in uh, a lot of string line work a lot of just making things really really tight i got uh one of our new new employees here aaron he's a, a, a probably a 15 20 year veteran of uh, erecting pre-engineered metal buildings and uh, he came on a few months ago with us really to assist me in answering day-to-day -day questions on um, you know hel helping customers you know with the volume that we're doing we get so many calls i I'm, I'm unable to actually do most of those calls myself so he's been a great help and uh, so what we have here is uh, 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 I don't know we're about probably 10,500 feet we have a 36 foot uh, long uh, 92 foot wide, so a 92 by 36. I think we're the eaves is just a one on 12 slope. A uh, this building has a 250 pound snow load, so there's going to be columns and rafters and purlins all over this thing, uh, just to support that snow load. Um, hopefully, you guys can hear me all right because the lift is working over there. We got the the semi truck with the building actually coming in here right now. Um, so we're going to be drilling and epoxying. Uh, we got one, two, two, four, six, eight eight sets of bolts that we're gonna drill and epoxy. Uh, so we're gonna show you how we lay that out. And uh, when we cut this up uh, or edit this, we're gonna be referring to this set of plans um, a lot. So uh, the topics that I intend to cover, just so you guys know, and uh, hopefully uh, in the description of this video, uh, we'll have a link to the other video, like specifically what what we're doing, you know, what video to go and check out so that you can easily go to, you know, any of the information you need. We're going to go over the steel line information, uh, how we're starting panels, uh, you know, how we're finishing panels, how we're cutting panels, how we're trimming out the, the framed openings. Um, um, hopefully, we, I, the, the bolts here are almost perfect, but hopefully we run into a couple of minor issues uh, that we can go over, things that, you know, you might expect to see in the, in the field. So, um, uh, a little bit about this building. This one's kind of unique. Uh, so besides the, you know, the snow load and the location, um, the panels on this, uh, th through a new supplier that we have, we're actually able to get cold rolled panels. So these are what uh, are used in what we call like a Telluride roof, uh, rusted uh, panels that rust out, look vintage. Um, these are 24 gauge panels. But what we did, instead of doing the standard corrugated panel that you usually see with that stuff, uh, we ran it through the through the roll former and ran it in our profile. And then we uh, did cocoa brown trim to match. And um, yeah, all, this, all the screws are, are cocoa brown, so they'll match it when it rusts out. And it'll be pretty cool. It's gonna be a, a real fun project. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, not, not even just for great Western buildings, but hopefully for anybody, uh, this, I intend for this to be, you know, w one of the more uh, useful videos for instructions on, on how to, or at least series. So uh, here, here comes the truck. You might want to check that out and we'll start getting to this. Thanks.
All right, so kind of like the first instructional video here. Uh, as you can see, we got, you know, we're starting to lay out tools on the slab, cleaning up the bolts. Uh, uh, what Garrett's doing over there, he's just making sure that the bolts are clean. There's no extra concrete on them. Maybe lube them up with a little bit of WD-40. And um, we also have a, a die to run down the threads of the bolts, uh, just in case we need to clean. They got dinged up during, uh, well, the concrete was getting poured. That way, when we set the columns, the bolts are going to run down good, and we're not going to accidentally cross-thread something. Uh, so that's what's going on right now. And Aaron is over there. Looks like he's doing some pretty, uh, pretty tough math. Um, he's laying out the location for the bolts that we're going to have to drill in the in the in the centers for the center columns. Um, Dan just got his truck in here. That is uh, Dan's one of our local drivers. He pretty much only hauls for us now. Uh, we got him on the road all the time. If you get a chance to work with this guy or have him at your job site, it's, it's just a pleasure. He, he, a lot of truck drivers, you know, they don't know the material that well and they're not anxious to get out of the truck and help it. Dan, you just can't stop him. He's, he's always moving. So, um, you know, the building came from, the, fr from our factory down in Junction um, and we got it loaded up. So as soon as Dan gets unstrapped here, we're gonna use the telehandler uh, to unload. And the way we're going to segregate this is we're probably going to get panels and trim and stuff that goes on um, after, you know, later in the, you know, after the frame is up. So panels, trim, we're going to get those out of our way a little bit, probably stash them um, over there so they don't get dinged with a piece of equipment. And also just mostly so they're just, you know, out of our work area. Um, and we'll start to stage the, the gray iron and the purlins. Um, Perlins and gray iron will be going up at the same time. Get the warehouse box off, get it on the, get it on the slab so we can uh, break into it because we're going to need hardware out of that pretty quick. And probably get the mastics and, and sealants and stuff that we're not going to need until we're sheeting. Uh, probably get that packaged up and, and off of the, out of the work area. Um, so yeah, that's... That is about it. I'm, I'm really excited to, to be putting this stuff on. I think it's going to look fantastic, uh, especially with the brown trim. While I'm out here, I'm thinking of things that have caused problems on job sites during delivery um, and, and during construction for our customers. And, and just something that uh, I want to make sure is going on at a job site when we show up to put it up. And if you, if you follow along and make sure that your site is prepped, it's going to make everything easier, particularly unloading. Here with uh, Dant, you know, the site, right next to the building site, uh, we have plenty of room for staging, right? We're not gonna have to be picking out a big tall stacks or anything. And I think the space you need really, really matters on the size of the building, right? Here, this isn't a real big building, but it's a lot of components. It's actually surprisingly large for the square footage or heavy. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is, is we deliver on semis almost all the time. Sometimes we can arrange a gooseneck or a hot shot uh, for tight job sites, but then we can't consolidate. The building has to be small, you know, only, you know, 15, 18,000 pounds at max, 40 by 60 range or smaller. Um, but if it's consolidated freight and you're sharing a load with somebody to save cost, it's got to be on a semi. Um, and if you don't have access for the semi, uh, that, that it means you have to unload somewhere else. And it's really up to the driver. Here we have Dant, he's got a giant truck um, with, with massive power, so he can go places a lot of other semis can't um, or just won't. Uh, and with, with shipping, it's always up to the driver. They, they're the ones carrying the CDL. Uh, so just keep that in mind and plan a little bit ahead. Ron or, or anybody in our shipping department uh, can communicate that to you. Uh, sometimes Ron, I, I love that guy to death, He'll uh, it, tell you about it 10 times, I'm sure, and we cover it in emails and the shipping documents and stuff. But here you can actually see. Uh, we had plenty of room for the truck and we have plenty of room for staging. Um, uh, when we're talking about job site prep, you can see that this area is all flat and level all the way around the building. Um, because the slab has already been poured, we can use hard wheeled lifts inside the building for hanging purlins and, and getting up into the rafters. Uh, when we go to sheet the building from the outside, uh, we're going to need a, uh, a rough terrain telehandler or a, or a, a man basket type boom, something that can go off road. Uh, and we have two, two, two options here. Uh, we have the rough terrain telehandler or, tele, or uh, scissor lift, which is always my favorite. Uh, pro erectors and the crews that really 
you know, they do this for a living every day. They prefer the man baskets. I, I like this because you can extend that st extend that platform and there's a lot of space. You can throw tools down in the bottom. You can, you, you know, throw buckets of bolts, whatever you need. And you don't necessarily have to keep everything in bags. In the man baskets, they're small and, and they're, they're just too tight, but um, they are a little bit more nimble. Also, as you can see, we have probably 20 feet of level ground at a minimum on all sides of the building. I think that's a little overkill. Usually 10 feet is enough, but you wanna make sure that you're able to get your equipment, not only in that 10 foot area, but that you have enough space to bring it around the corner. Uh, if you can't get your equipment over, or if you're too close, you could run over the edge of the slab and bend your bolts, um, or not even be able to get the equipment back there at all, and then you're working off ladders, and that, that sucks. So. Uh, just a little bit of thought on job site prep and, and we're continuing to prep here with uh, uh, getting the bolts, getting the bolts done. That's gonna make things easier when we're erecting. And that's it, it's time to, it's time to unload this thing. So we're gonna start building this on the back, uh, or the right end, well, I guess. This is kind of a goofy shaped building, so it's, it's actually wider than it is long. But, um, so we're gonna start building on this side and then working forward. Actually, I think uh, what I was talking with Aaron, I think our plan is to start in that corner and build out the bays as we move forward. So we kind of segregated the material so that we have frame line three, um, easy to grab. And then we have our parts for frame line two sitting here with a little bit of frame line three on top because uh, we're going to grab those first. And then uh, there's actually two frame lines in this building that are uh, called frame line two. It's the same parts, they're the center bays. So that's all staged up here. And then frame line one is in the back here with rafters and everything. But we decided to take the columns and put the uh, frame line one's columns. Um, in front of that because the the columns are going to get set before we can put up the rafters as far as secondaries and Panels go we moved our panels as far out of the way as we could just so we don't accidentally hit them with the machine We're not going to need them until all of the rest of this material is out of here or at least that and the trim box and uh, We have some of the interior columns that belong down on this end of the building staged up over here. So just a little bit of planning and it'll save us from moving and moving and moving material while we're on the job site. So um, right now the guys are setting these uh, epoxied anchor bolts for the interior columns and it seems like, there, it looks like the mag drill is not working the way it is. That's a darn nice mag drill, to, or not a mag drill, a uh, uh, rotary hammer drill. And if you have the availability, if you're going to be doing your bolts or drilling or doing any epoxying, more than just one or a mistake or something, um, if you have access to one of the big rotary hammer drills, you can rent them uh, or, you know, if budget's not a concern, buy one. They're, they're always, you know, helpful. The bigger, the better, especially when we're doing this where we're going 7 eighths. We're drilling a 7 eighths inch hole in concrete uh, 12 inches deep. So uh, seems like that one's broken maybe. I don't know. Um, so anyways, I just wanted to go over how we staged the job site and... I guess that's about it. We're going to uh, come back when we're epoxying some bolts, show you how we do that, and, and then we'll start setting some, uh, setting some columns. Um, we've set, uh, we've set three bolts in epoxy, uh, when they started drilling on this one, the concrete ch chipped and, um, you know, so it's hard to keep our bolt in the right place. So what we're going to do is actually bring the column over or one of the extra, uh, base plate templates or something and set it down and over drill the, one of the holes to a seven eighths. Um, 
and use that as a template to hold our drill straight while we go in since it chipped out. So uh, we'll go ahead and let these three set up. Here, here we did get all four holes nice and it's important when you're doing epoxy, a few things that you're gonna need. Um, a hole brush, you gotta clean the inside of these holes and you're gonna need compressed air and something to get that compressed air down in the hole. And then brush again. I go, I do it two or three times, four times until I stop seeing much dust come out of the hole. So every time you brush it, you're gonna make a little bit of dust, but we're just trying to get any loose stuff off the walls of the concrete. This is a, re this is a really nice tool to have, something that mixes the epoxy for you. They do have epoxy that is two-part epoxy that comes in a single tube and you just use a regular old um, uh, caulk gun, but uh, these double ones are nice and, and they don't kill your arms and your fingers. And you can see how easy this stuff just comes out. I don't know if it's kind of in the shade here. But, um, it really just comes squirting out and it's kind of just where you have to get it by feel on how much epoxy you need to put in there. If you overfill it and you put the bolt in, the, uh, the epoxy is gonna overflow. So, take some pressure off this and I'll pick the good end and the bad end of the rod and just kind of push and twist. And here, I didn't get enough epoxy in the hole. Let's just let her slide down in that one and I'll give her a few more squirts. We don't need the epoxy to come all the way to the top. Um, we drilled down 12 inches and all we need, oh, oh, air bubble. And all we actually need here, I think is eight inches of depth on these particular bolts. So we don't need the epoxy to come all the way to the top of the bolt, but it'll look better and make everybody feel better if it does. I kind of made a mess there. Now it's gonna take this epoxy a couple of hours to kind of tack up. So I'm, I'm just gonna leave them loose in the hole until I get all four in and then we'll, we'll, we'll square them up and make sure that they're level uh, by using the speed square. And the speed square or any sort of square is another good thing to use while you're doing the drilling just to make sure that you're going in straight. You don't want your bolt coming off at an angle. That guy in there. So a little heavy, that's okay. We can just scoop that up. We don't want that to cure uh, like that because it'll interfere with the column or the base plate of the column when we go to put it, put it on. Oh, I got that one dead on. Congratulations, Eric. We cleaned up one side with an angle grinder so we'd be able to get a nut on easily. So I'm just looking at which end I want sticking out. And if you're gonna do something like this and you want an extra template or something like that, give us a call. If you're gonna try to do this work before the building arrives, we may be able to get you uh, you know, like a, one of these in the mail or something. I'll show you what I'm talking about. This is just a piece of scrap steel that we had in the shop and we just went ahead and punched holes on the machine. So we can make this, like I said, this is scrap, but it does take time. So we'll charge a few bucks for it. Um, so we can use this to adjust. After I clean up the epoxy, I'll come back and do this again, just to make sure. But that is about as good as we're gonna get, so. I'm pretty happy with that. <laughs> Look, they're, they're, they think it might be too hot, so they're using the leaf blower to try to cool it down. I don't think that's a problem, fellas. So we got, we got them all set. They look good. Garrett's been working his ass off. And so what we decided to do is just go ahead and hang this back wall, right? Because these bolts have been poured in place and have been here for over a month. Uh, so we know we're good. We can crank on them if we need to. Uh, so we have our uh, five end wall columns up here. Uh, we haven't done that corner one yet just because we didn't find it. Uh, and we also got one of the mainframe rafters or mainframe columns up. Uh, bay two, three, and four on this uh, right end wall. Uh, the plans show that we're using uh, 
dirt eight uh, in bay, well, I guess bay two, three, and bay four. Um, so we brought our girts over, we checked them. Everything's labeled with the number. The top has a bundle number, so I know that there's 11 G8s in here. There's also 11 in this bundle. And on the girts, you can also see that it's labeled here. We ran these kind of on the side without doing all the paperwork, but normally you get a real nice printed tag there. Uh, but everything's labeled and numbered, so it corresponds with the plans. This is a flush end wall. And what we're talking about here is instead of the girts uh, running on the outside of the column, uh, like they will on the sidewalls, like they will on the roof, and we'll show you that later, they actually just bolt right here. So we'll set these up, outside flange, toes down, and uh, we're just gonna run up and get these set in place. We're not gonna worry about tightening them or torquing them or anything like that. We're just gonna get them hand tight uh, where everything will slip around. As far as the fastening goes, um, when we're talking structural, holes do not get washers. However, slots do get washers. So when this girt sits up here, girt is on top, and the girt's the same thing as a purlin, uh, the girt will actually get a washer, right? Because it's a slotted hole, so the hole's a little bit oversized. We supply enough washers to go on both sides. Uh, so a washer up, you know, on that, and then there'll be a washer underneath the nut. Um, there's no good reason for us to supply all those, but some customers are like me and they want them, so we do that. Uh, I think it looks better, it makes me feel better. Aaron here, a trick he has, and, and something my brother does, he's a professional erector too, is they'll pre-assemble these things so they can just pull it out of their bags. I never like doing that because then I have to fiddle with it, and it's easier for me just to have my washers, my nuts, and my uh, bolt in a bag. The only thing we're gonna be using is spud wrenches, just if we need to twist the hole, because these columns aren't set in place. You can see they're all kind of weeby wobbly and stuff like that. So we might need to you know, move them around a little bit. That's all we're gonna do right now. Set them in place temporarily, or not temporarily, but uh, loosely, um, just to give the steel a little bit more structure. We're not worried about wind blowing these things over in the middle of the night. Um, these are big anchor bolts and there's just not enough surface area on the column. I mean, it, it would, I mean, I doubt a hurricane would even make it move. So here we go. So our plan is to get the G8s up. We got some G6s that we got to put in down, down there because they're a little bit shorter. And then, uh, we'll get the, the girts going to that, uh, end wall col or the, uh, sidewall column too. We, we got all of our bolts set. All of the epoxy is in there curing. It's actually stiffening up a little bit. So uh, a good day. We got up here about 10 o'clock. Uh, we'll be starting tomorrow, you know, 7.38, something like that. Um, so unloading the truck. Uh, that was a big truck. This is not that big of a building, but because of the loads and the number of pieces, it's really heavy, almost 40,000 pounds. Um, so it took us a couple hours to unload it. And uh, we got right to work and we were able to get this end wall pretty much, the columns on the end wall framed or, or stood up. Uh, we got one bay of, uh, one, one bay of girts on uh, just while we were wrapping up uh, for the end of the day. But you know, this was a pretty good day and I would think uh, it's about beer time. So thank you. All right, I'll see you guys in the morning. Welcome back. Uh, this is day two of our build in Floresta, Colorado, or just outside of Crested Butte. Uh, we just finished up lunch and uh, we kind of had a little bit of a slower start, kind of moving some stuff around and um, getting some of the guys, you know, up to speed on stuff. But um, what we've been doing or what we decided to do is 
go ahead and finish up uh, one of our brace bays. And uh, we're still working on that right now. We wanna get that square, plumb, tight, everything. So we've hung purlin, uh, we've hung uh, the girts on the one wall. We're getting our rod bracing in right now, starting to plumb it up. We've checked elevations. We're good there. Uh, so once we got this, you know, these four columns here, it's kind of a unique building because it has so many interior columns. So we're kind of good build a box. Um, and once we have that perfectly plumbed, that's going to make it a lot easier for us to build the rest of the building um, on keeping things plumbed. So uh, this is big enough. We don't want to just hang all of the steel and then come back and, and then try to plumb the whole building at once. We'll be chasing, you know, loose or tight bolts around um, for days. So it's, uh, in this scenario, it is best to start, you know, like the, uh, the erection manual says, you know, uh, get one bay totally braced. And uh, so that's what we're working on. And then we're going to continue building out on the uh, left side of this building because this has flush walls on the, on the side walls. That's not typical, but um, you know, some buildings get it and it's, it's kind of a nice feature sometimes. So uh, that means that those big rod braces have to go through the girts, right through the middle. Um, we don't have the capability. I, you know, I don't know anybody that does it as a standard. Well, they'll punch that in the shop. Um, so uh, we have to field cut those. Looking at the drawings, we highlight the measurements on where to cut those. Uh, so there is an instruction on the size of a hole or a slot uh, so that the rod brace or the cable brace will run through. Uh, and that's nice because we get to do that work on the ground rather than running a string line and, and you know, having to cut it off of a, a telehandler or, a, or a, a scissor lift or up in the air. Up on the purlin system, uh, this is going to get bridging or what we call basically purlin bridging or blocking. Um, and we go back and forth depending on the building. Sometimes it's strapping, sometimes it's bridging, but the bridging gets a clip and normally you'll, you'll install that up in the air. But since we have so many people, I went ahead and did all that attaching. So we're throwing them up in the air with the, with the bridging clips already installed. Uh, it's just going to speed us up later. We kind of went over it a little bit yesterday, but I thought I'd do a little bit more detail here because it is important. I want everybody to understand uh, that watches this because we put a lot of work uh, lining these holes out uh, for you to use in the field. And even pro erectors, they'll see it in the drawings and not know what it is because there's not really anybody else that I'm aware of that does it. Uh, because this bay here and the next bay are both braced and it's tiered bracing means that we have an X brace here and then we have another X brace on the top and we're using the center girt as a strut. We're going to have an X brace come from one of these holes and then on the other side we're going to have to move over a set of holes. So the X brace that's going to run down there is going to land in this hole and the X brace that's going to run down here is going to land in this hole. That's pretty unique. The reason this is happening is just because this is such a high load building, 250 pounds per square foot snow load, roof load. Um, it just requires a lot of bracing. Um, a lot of times on a sidewall, we'd wind up putting a portal frame here. This one inch rod really worked out better. It was stronger, better than doing two portal frames. And because the building's never going to have any access from this side, uh, there's no reason not to have X brace. In most buildings, you're only going to have a single bay of X brace. And so instead of two holes, you'll just have one in the center, right? And that lines up to the center of the girt line. So if you have 10 inch girts, it's going to be five inch offset on eight inch girts like we have here. Uh, it would normally be a, a four inch offset, but here we're going two and six because we got to line those up. So on the drawings, uh, this wall is frame line A or the front side wall. I'm intentionally lining everything out from this direction with my, with my flanges so down just so I can just to keep my bearings right. I don't want to flip around and have to think in 180 degrees. It really doesn't matter because no matter which way I do these, we just have to spin the girt. But just so we don't have to spin it around once it's up in the air, I'm just making sure it's right. I'm going to start in this bay here, bay three, and I'm starting on the low girt. Uh, which is G, which are, these are all G10s. There is a circle here for us with a seven. And that circle calls out in the field work table. Line number seven shows me that the first slot is two foot one and seven sixteenths from the end of the girt. And the next one from the same end measuring over is eight foot ten and seven sixteenths. Normally, and you'd want to check this in the field, um, 
it's going to be the same from both ends, uh, but we do lay it out left to right. So you can come back in, check, uh, which I did there. And I have two foot one and seven sixteenths from both edges. And this one is also lining up at eight foot 10 and seven sixteenths. So what I've done, because those holes are offset, I'm gonna slot this hole on the inside of the, or the outside of the girt. And this slot is gonna be on the outside of the girt. Or the inside, I'm sorry. Inside and outside. All I'm using is just an angle grinder. I recommend you put your guards on. I don't have my guard on and I definitely use heavier duty gloves. But we're gonna cut this. That way when we place it, uh, we'll be able to thread the rods straight through. And because it's tiered, we're gonna stop here. We're gonna thread these rods once the girts are in place and then we'll install the upper girts so that we can uh, bring the rods in without the lower girts interfering. Then I'll move down to this bay here, do the same thing. The whole roof is braced with a series of cables. But those go in basically the same way. Uh, with the measurements, you can use a hole saw. Uh, this steel is pretty tough. Uh, so sometimes you, 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 know, you might use them up. Um, but they, you know, a cutoff wheel is fine. In the back of the plans, there is a detail on how to lay this out and what we're doing. Here, uh, because of the size, one inch, uh, or sorry, one inch wide and three inches long is the max. Here I'm going a little bit bigger than that because uh, we have so many girts. But uh, a one inch, a one inch wide slot, the the rod would really be tight in there. We want a little bit of wiggle room, so. The roof is bypass, meaning the purlin actually rides on top of the on top of the rafter. Um, and normally on girts, or at least on sidewall girts, that's also going to be bypass. Uh, here, because we have a flush condition, we have to cut that. But up on the roof, we don't have to do any of this slotting because the uh, cable braces actually run below the girt line. Having this work done here makes cutting these holes down on the ground easier. You're going to get a better cut. You're not working off a ladder or working up in the air, and you're not having a string line uh, to, to figure out where you want to put your holes. So, uh, like I said, uh, it makes it a lot easier, and I hope everybody uses this, and I, I hope that the, the work that we put in uh, is taken advantage of in the field. So, um, all right, I'm gonna get to cutting these. Thanks. So what Todd's doing up there right now is uh, installing a purlin just to brace the outside wall with the inside wall. It turns it into a little bit of a moment frame kind of. So they'll get a couple of purlins up there temporarily. They're only going to be putting in one or two bolts. Maybe on the end they'll put in uh, the full set of bolts. But on the main rafter uh, that bears where bears at, we're only going to drop one bolt in there because that bolt's going to have to be pulled out when we bring in the nested purlin later. Really, this is just uh, to keep everybody safe and keep the building safe while we're erecting. And we don't want to just throw up all the purlins. Of course we could. It'll just take time, but while we got the lift, the idea is get all the heavy iron off the ground, get it up in the air, clean up the job site, and then we can come in and infill purlins. So as soon as you get a rafter up, you want it to smash up a, a, at least a few purlins. If it's windy, maybe even all of them. Now that these guys have this set up, they're going to move out to this, to the next frame line and we're gonna keep building forward and then we'll move down. Uh, once we get here, we'll just tie them in together. All of our frames are coated in a gray oxide primer. It's the same thing as a red oxide primer, uh, what we call a red iron building. Um, what, what kind of sets us apart, there's a lot of other companies that do it too, is the galvanized secondaries, right? So our frames we paint gray just because it matches with the galvanizing. It's, it's the same as red oxide, no different. 
and it, it is sometimes a finished coating. It, it does look good. You know, it, it is okay to leave this as a finish and you know, 99% of metal buildings just have this as a finish. The purpose of the primer though, is really just to protect the steel from rust during transport and during erection. And while you're moving steel around on the job site, heck, while we move steel around in our shipping yard, when you load it on the truck with the dunnage, this primer is gonna get damaged. And over here is a good, a good example. It's, it's filthy, we got boot marks on it. Once this whole frame is done, come back, wash the boot, boot prints, get the dust off of it, and then that'll, let the, that'll allow the customer to reprime it if he wants. The primer's good for a different color paint. Um, in fact, I'm thinking of a customer that we have in, uh, in Montana, and he, or maybe Idaho. He painted his entire framing system to match his uh, classic car that he has. Uh, it's like a bright orange, it's, it's beautiful. Maybe I can try to find a picture of that and it will upload it with the video. So don't be worried about stuff like this. It's like I said, it's just there to protect the frames from rust during transport and uh, you can always come back in and, and touch it back up. So when we look at a roof, we're looking top down and that's the way we number our purlins, right? So on this building, this is what we'd look at as the first bay. Uh, the front of the building. Um, so here we've laid out, we have all of the P1s all the way up to the peak. Our P2s are gonna be the entire center section. And then in the back wall, we're gonna have P1s in the back bay, but they're gonna be in the opposite corner. And this isn't true on every building, but for the most part, um, it is. The way that Perlin is marked is really important for where it goes in the building. We have a P1, we have a P2, and then down here we have a P3. If it was a number one punch, we'd only have one foot, one and three quarter inch lap. So this set of holes would actually be down here. A number three punch is a three foot lap. And so our holes would be here in a four, a number four punch. Uh, it would actually be about here. So we have what we call our CP punch. Uh, it's just a four by four punch right on the end. And this is steel line. We have our end punches for the overlap. So all overlaps get bolt holes right on the end. And this is to tie back a flange brace from the other side. Same thing with this. And then two, two bolt holes here. Purlins always go up the rafter, or the, the bottom flange toes down the rafter. The P3 is the same thing as a P1, except it's reversed with the punching. If you get confused with this, the roof plan will tell you exactly what the overlap is. We have an overlap of two foot, one and three quarter. So from the end of the purlin to the center of the clip, we're two foot, one and three quarter. So you can always find that set of holes. And the same is true on the opposite side. I'm not sure if Justin can see this, but I think everybody gets it. Two foot, one and three quarter is the center line of the purlin. Our flans are not equal widths. And we do that particularly on heavy gauge purlin, nesting them can become a little bit of a chore. We want the flanges to be as close together as possible. So here we have a thinner flange. These are uh, 10 by two and a half Zs. Here we have two and an eighth, and here we have two and three eighths. That way we can flip the purlin so that we have the two and three eighths over here and the two and one eighth here. And if you have three and a half inch flanges, it's the, you know, it's, it's the same thing. They're just, they're just a little bit wider. Here, I think we're only dealing with 16 gauge because we have our purlins on two foot centers and we have really short bays. So I hope that helps explain punch patterns and, and, the, and the reason why uh, the purlins are all numbered a lot different. And I really hope that this helps out some troubleshooting on job sites. It's a question that we answer a lot. All right, so um, angle iron, right? Like a four by two for like base angles or sag angles or something. A lot of people have questions. They, they're like, hey, we're, we're not seeing this stuff. What we actually do with that, when you have a uh, trim, you know, almost every building's gonna have a trim package. We'll take the four by two angle and we put it on the outside of the trim box. So that's not there only for the trim box. That's material that you need for the truck. So if uh, you're not finding that while you're doing your inventory, um, take a look at the trim box. Sometimes we put uh, like obtuse angle, uh, uh, like three by three open angles or something inside of the trim box in the bottom. But it just makes the trim box hold up a whole lot better. So there's uh, two 12 by 12 openings and then uh, three 18 by 14s, I believe. They're either 16 by 14 or 18 by 14. I'll figure it out in a little bit. Um, so I, I decided to go ahead and start on the, uh, on the first bay of the end wall here. Um, 
And I'm doing this a little bit different. Aaron uh, was asking me, you know, hey, Eric, what the heck are you doing? I like to do as much work as possible on the ground. Uh, I went, I, I grabbed my uh, DJ one, I grabbed my DJ two, and we should be showing those, showing you those on the drawings right now. And uh, I went ahead and I got the, uh, the clips on. So we used to do everything in the building all welded clip. Uh, we advertised that and we, we've, we've kind of changed uh, the way we do that and I'll, I'll explain. Since we did change, so all, all of our clips are welded on heavy iron, right? So anything that a purlin or a girt is gonna be bolting to um, is going to be pre-welded. Um, even on cold form, like cold form rafters, all of that's going to be pre-welded. Uh, the only thing that we're not pre-welding anymore is basically door jams and door headers. Uh, we do go ahead and weld on the base plate on the door jams, but we don't weld on the clips. When we build these up, or when, when we weld them, and the clips are on, and we'll bundle them. The only good way to do it is to bundle, um, you know, six or eight or however many together. And we slide the clips in so they're, they're facing each other. And as much as we ask truck drivers not to overstrap this stuff, and this stuff always goes on top of the load, when they're like that, they're real prone to strap damage. And we had a lot of customer service issues. We had to send out a lot of material due to trucking damage, of course. Any damage during shipping that truck drivers or the trucking companies are supposed to pay, of course they do not. Um, and uh, we even tried like putting blocks of wood in between, but th those blocks of wood would, would fall out and truckers, they check their straps again and again as they're going down the road and eventually they'll get damaged. So uh, base plates only, and then we have to bolt these on. So it is a little bit more work, uh, but it's a whole lot better to, you know, spend an extra hour or something erect in the building than wait in a week and a half for uh, replacement parts because of shipping damage. So these clips, I think they're CL 103s. Um, they they just bolt into the uh, into the pre-punched holes here. I, I I didn't put a, a clip there for a reason. It gets a different clip and it goes on this side. And on these because they get cover trim like this you get what we call a fin neck bolt. Or some people call them round heads, button heads, basically a carriage bolt. They have these little fins on them. So as you tighten the nut, these fins will dig into the outside of the steel and that's what holds it in place. The reason we're using a, a fin neck or a button head bolt is because the door jams on garage door openings are gonna get cover trim. That way the building looks nice from the outside because garage doors roll down on the inside. So you're gonna see this part of the structure from the outside of the building. And if we were to use a standard hex head bolt, we wouldn't be able to get this trim on and make it fit real nice. Now, this building here has girt on two foot centers. Standard placement for a first girt is at seven foot four, and then about four to five feet after that, depending on the overall uh, height of the building. So uh, th this looks like a lot, and it is. Uh, but this is kind of a unique situation because of the snow load and the way that we're designing the building. So um, it only took me about five minutes to get all of these on. I did go ahead, when I placed these, I grabbed a tape measure from the end, from the end of the base plate and measured out to one foot or two foot. Um, and that's where we want the top of this plate. If you don't get it perfect, it doesn't matter, but these holes are a little weebly wobbly. Um, they're slotted for a reason so that there is some play, but we wanna make sure that they're level. Before I bolted these in, I took the speed square and just verified that they were flat. And it's a six inch clip on an eight inch jam, so I'm holding one inch and one inch to just keep it centered. And I just worked my way up and uh, got those on there. So uh, door head or the header trim is going to have to be installed once the frame or once the opening is in place. So I'm going to go ahead and start pop riveting this in and I'm going to keep the outside up against. These are a little bit wider just for the uh, tolerances in cold form. And my first pop rivet I'm going to place is going to be perfectly centered on the, on the flange of the door jam rather than centered in this. I'm going to hold it there. I'm gonna go two inches 
And then I'm gonna go 24 inches on center the rest of the way up. This is the DJ, sorry, this is the DJ2. So this is the longer one, so I will actually hold it this way because this is gonna be the outside of the building. Um, I'm also gonna hold the trim up from the base plate about a 16th of an inch. Just so I know that I have clearance, when we go to set this on the concrete, we're not gonna accidentally drag the trim and bend it. Uh, on most buildings, we're gonna come back in and we're gonna silicone around the bottom, especially on the outside, but also on the inside, you know, while, while you're there, just to stop water. So we'll use brown silicone to wrap that and you'll never see it. It'll be a really, really nice, uh, nice looking piece of uh, trim work. Once I have this trim attached, I'm gonna grab my uh, step bit and from, from the back side, I'm gonna drill a hole in this and then I'm gonna place this clip upside down. And then later, once it's standing, we can put the door header underneath. Because I'm doing it that way, I'm not gonna have to do any trimming on this trim. You just run it long, you'll never notice it from the inside, it's gonna look good. I think it looks better. The other way is to install the clip, install the door header, and then come in and install this. But in order to do that, so you don't have a joint there, you need to trim the web of the, of the trim back. And it, it's tough work and you never get a perfectly straight cut. This is gonna allow us to, you know, even if we don't get a perfect cut on the cover trim for the header, it's all gonna be brown. So it's gonna look really, really nice. And that's, that's the reason I like to do it that way. And besides, like I said, it's easier to do it on the ground. Uh, this trim is really janky and easy to bend. So when you're handling it on the job site, especially we got some 20 footers over there for these uh, uh, wider doors, uh, two or three people when you're carrying it around, uh, you can see there's a little crease already in there just from pulling it out of the box. So while we're filming, I thought I'd just kind of go ahead and show everybody how I do this. Um, the, the trim comes with a plastic coating on it. I always pull the coating before I throw the trim on. It just means you gotta be extra careful with it. Not like the plastic coating is really gonna prevent scratches. I don't like doing it because once I pop rivet and then you go to start peeling plastic back, it always hangs up and it's almost impossible to get it all out of there. So this is the outside. I went ahead and placed those pop rivets. That's gonna get J trim on it uh, after the building's put up. So I'm not real worried about centering those fasteners. So I'm gonna go ahead, but this is gonna be visible on the inside of the building. So I'm going two inches and I'm gonna go 24 inches on center after that. So now I'm going 26, I'm gonna go 50, six foot two inches and I'm just making a little mark just a little mark so I can see it with the speed square later um, eight foot ten foot two and honestly you're probably never going to see these rivets and if you do see them you're not going to see them well enough to know if they're straight and in line uh, if they're on perfect centers, but it's easy enough to do it. So I go ahead and do it anyways. So I'm gonna come down. I have a two and a half inch flange on this. There, we'll go here. I'm gonna find my mark. I'm gonna come down an inch and a quarter, which is right where I put my mark. I'm gonna make a little mark. If there's any, uh, you know, pin mark left on it, just some rubbing alcohol will take off Sharpie off this stuff. But I try to be as neat as possible and I use a, a, a brand new Sharpie, as fine of a point as I can get. And so I have my mark, I know where I'm going. And I would be real careful not to over drill this and smash the drill into the face of the trim, or at least if I can. There, nice. I mean, you can do that a lot faster, obviously. Just when you, oh, grab those pop rivets. Do that a lot faster, but you run the risk of 
smashing it into the trim and you will see that scratch on the outside later and the the only good thing Milwaukee makes is this tool right here uh oh yeah see what I said Milwaukee there we go all right perfect so I'm gonna do those the rest of the way and keep them right there at an inch and a quarter off this it's gonna look beautiful Last night, when I, or yesterday afternoon, when I built these two, uh, two door jams up, because I didn't look at the plans, and this is kind of a unique thing, like most buildings aren't gonna have something like this, but we're really pushing the limits on this one on how wide the doors can be for where the frames are. And we have a lot of clip to clip connection, no girt in between them. Um, and on the plans, there's these square call outs for my connection plates. And on DJ1, I have uh, seven number twos, and on DJ3, I have two, four, six, seven number threes. So over here in the member table, number threes are GW500s, and number twos are CL103s. I'm so used to seeing CL103 clips that I just grabbed a stack, didn't even pay attention to the numbering on them. And he here's the difference, right? The holes are in the same same distance the clips are the same size the only difference is the gauge the 500 has a wider gauge than the 103 so it's easy to get these mixed up and of course we had them banded uh, we had them all banded together labeled in, in a big bundle we don't write the clip number on each one we just tie a, a string through it but here on the job, since we've been moving around, everything's been mixed up. So now we're having to go through and figure out which ones are which. I put 500s where I needed 103s and I put 103s where I needed 500s. So I have to take off all of this trim that I put on to save myself time and switch these clips out. So uh, it's important to slow down. And I mean, this is, it's not a disaster but it just cost me a half hour. Um, so whenever you can, just take a look at the plans, look at the details. If you think you're, if you're making an assumption, you're probably, you know, or at least me, I'm always wrong when I start assuming stuff. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to point that out. So now I'm gonna get to this and try to enjoy the rest of the day. We have here, there's a couple of spud wrenches. Aaron's got one, I got one. I'm gonna just rest this here. And if we look here, we can see that these two flanges are jamming up a little bit. Now, it's light enough gauge, we're probably gonna be able to get it in to line up these holes, right? Um, but what I wanna show you, here, let's, uh, or here, you go ahead and spud that one. I can spud here. A spud wrench, what, is, what a spud wrench is supposed to do, see how these holes aren't lined up at all? A spud wrench will suck the purlin down and nest them properly, right? Or, or at least, or line up the holes properly. Here, I think that we have this one um, incorrect. In fact, I know we do. Uh, let's, we're gonna pull this and we're gonna set this one on top of this one and see what we can get. So, let's... Check it. And spud. I'm gonna bring it over. All right, and now you can let the spud go. Yep. Now, without any spud, all of our holes here are lined up a lot better. We're still gonna have to do a little bit of spud work just to get it set down. 
And you can't see it from this, from that side, but this is a really tight joint here. And well, before we do that, well, and, and a, a, a trick that I like to do is if you're having a hard time lining these up and depending on the height of the rafter, the deflection on the rafter, these holes are gonna move around a little bit. A cool trick is to come in and go ahead and set your lap bolts first. You got a washer and a nut. And I'm not gonna bother taping this or, or putting a tape measure on it, but when we're talking about uh, the purlin lap on the roof plan, that one inch or one foot, one and three quarter, because this is a, or two foot, one and three quarter, this is a number two lap. So from here to the center of this clip is gonna measure out two foot, one and three quarter inch. Um, and now that we have this in, All right, and now we can move on to the next one. I'll let these guys keep uh, keep uh, working up the uh, keep working up the frame here. Uh, almost wrapped up getting those purlins up, man. These purlins, I they're a little under two foot on center, so um, it's a lot of a lot of bolts and stuff. But uh, so what I did, or what we're doing now, I, that wall back there is already pretty much plumb and square uh this wall is not you probably can't see it in the in the picture or in the video but uh all four of these columns are leaning over probably close to two inches at the top no big deal we knew that when we started setting them um so uh now we're gonna fix it i've taken all of the rod brace and went ahead and made sure that i have everything snugged up not tight um still a little bit loose because we're going to be doing some uh quite a bit of movement here but I made sure that all of the hillsides, and this, this is obviously smaller, um, but even, even the big ones, they have this lip on them. So when they come into the frame, that lip connects with the frame. So I've got all those set, everything snugged up. And what we're gonna do is start tightening because the frame needs to come over uh, to our right. And we can tell by looking at the level, it's uh, it's gonna be quite a bit off once we get up there to the top. So, in order to fix that, we're gonna start using the bottom base and pulling over. We'll go back and forth from this bottom to that bottom as we bring both over. Uh, when you're checking level, especially on a, on a three plate like this or a, a welded I-beam that we've made in the shop, we don't wanna check level off of the web. Um, there's some variance in the machine and there's a tolerance allowed, but not with the flange. So the flange is always gonna be straight. So we wanna check with the outside flange and we don't wanna check with the inside flange because this is a tapered frame. Uh, it's got a slight taper to it. So we just wanna be on the outside. And also if we're checking plumb in and out of the building, we wanna be on the outside flange, never on the inside. And this one is pretty darn close. On a wide flange beam, the two corner columns of this are wide flange beams, so those are mill beams. So on a wide flange, uh, we can measure, we can hold plumb off of the off of the web. Like I said, we're going to start tightening from the bottoms. I've set all the tops to where I want them, especially on the outside, because we don't want that bolt going through uh, past the steel line uh, where it'll interfere with panels. So uh, we're going to do all of our tightening down at the bottom, and we're going to start. Like I said, we're going to start with this one, then we'll move over to this one. And we'll, we'll check it if we want some more movement. We'll come back here and we'll come back here and then we'll move up to the top here and here. And as we pull it over, it's going to slacken uh, the other side and that's fine. Even if those hillsides pop off, it's easy to go back up there and reset them. Um, in order to move this, the base plates are fairly snug. Um, since we want the column to come this way, we're gonna loosen uh, these two bolts on this side and what we're gonna try to do is only loosen the inside of the right side. You would think just by loosening these, we'd get the column to move. 
uh, it's like a uh, half inch or a five eighths inch base plate. And if, if these bolts are snug, it's, it's, even though it's, it's off of the center, it's gonna hold that plate down. So I'm gonna, tr because I like where it is in and out, I'm gonna try to leave that one on there. We might just take a little bit of tension off of it, uh, but I know for sure I need to loosen these three and probably we'll see, probably gonna have to loosen those. And we're gonna do that on all three of these, on all, actually all four of the columns uh, as we bring it over. That way we're not binding or bending the steel to get it to come plumb. Once that's done, we'll check our gap from the outside and see if we need to place any shims underneath. I, I imagine that we will, um, but we're probably only gonna move about a 16th of an inch, maybe even less. So a shim might not be necessary. Uh, just a 16th down there is gonna move the top of this thing um, a lot. So, all right, we're gonna get to, we're gonna get to it. Yesterday, uh, as you saw, we got that wall uh, plumbed up and then we moved up to the roof. We needed to move some of these columns out a little bit and we used the two bays of X bracing up here. Some buildings don't have um, X bracing, so come alongs work as well. Uh, this building has so much bracing just because of the load. Now that we got everything plumb, we moved these columns, we're good. We went and we checked our base plate bolts. Uh, the next thing that we're gonna do, actually we're, we're gonna move a little bit ahead because we got some other help coming today. And we're gonna have them go in and tighten all of the purlin bolts, put in all of our lap bolts and hang all of the flange bracing. Um, but since the building's tight, square and plumb and all the bracing is good, bolts are tight on the floor. So we're gonna uh, move onto the back wall here, maybe uh, pull out a little bit of dirt away from the foundation um, to give us some room. And we're gonna snap a line along the base an inch and a half down to hold for our base trim. And we're gonna set our base trim down here. Uh, we're gonna do a cool mitered corner, uh, but right now we're just gonna run it long and uh, we're gonna be able to start sheeting this wall today. Uh, so we'll probably start sheeting from that end, work in this direction. Uh, we've already got our four inch Z's uh, installed. Th these four inch Z's sometimes with a, a building with a rigid frame end wall or a hot rolled end wall, you'll find uh, like a pile of, of these in the, in the, uh, in the job box. And, and what, these are, what these are for is so when we run the panel, we have something to screw the panel to on the, on the corners and something to uh, put the corner trim on as well. Right now, Garrett and the guys, they're gonna go in, tighten up all of these girts and they're gonna make sure that they're uh, in line with the steel line. While we're talking about that, I wanna talk about steel line. I've, I've threatened to do this in a lot of videos. I've, I've hit on it uh, a couple of times just briefly. But when we talk about steel line and when you see in your drawing steel line, uh, what we're talking about is the edge of steel, right? Not the end of the panel, uh, not the bolts, uh, basically where the panel is gonna meet the, the, the girt system. Um, and right in line with the edge of the concrete. So all the way up, uh, that is, that is steel line. We have it on both walls, so steel line and steel line. This building doesn't have a concrete notch. It'd be nice if it did, but uh, they did not uh, do that. Uh, no big deal. We can still install the base trim. It just, uh, base trim attaches to the uh, base channel or base angle. And the other thing before we can sheet this wall, we're gonna have to bring in our four by two rake angles, which will run on top of the purlin and it gives the very top of the root of the wall sheet uh, something to attach to because you can't screw it into the purl in there. After, after we get all that and we're you know sheeting or whatever, we do need to come back and install the eave struts and there is a, uh, a purl in that's being used as a strut. So uh, once that's done, that's basically all of the structural steel except for the front. Uh, hopefully this is helpful understanding uh, what the steel line is and, and how we're gonna do base trim, but we'll make sure that Justin gets some good footage of the uh, base trim going in for you guys.
you've installed your first piece of trim, you want to start by making a clear mark along the steel line. Using our shears, we cut off the excess trim past this line. We then cut along the bottom fold. We want to cut the back leg of trim all of the way off. Align the trim on top so that the edge is flush with the trim beneath it. And mark your trim just like you see Aaron doing here. We are going to cut off the excess trim past that mark. We want to keep a little of this square part of the trim. If you do need to trim this section at all, make sure to leave enough room to place a rivet here at the end. Again, be sure the edge is flush with the trim below it and mark the second piece of trim at the steel line. Align the trim with the folded edge. Make another mark where the folded edges overlap. Make a straight line from this mark to the back edge of the trim. From the mark to the corner of the trim, draw a line. This line should be about 45 degrees. Remove the excess trim. Again, align the trim with the edge. Mark directly above the angled edge of the trim, like you see here. Draw a clear line between the steel line and this new mark. Lastly, extend this mark to the corner of the trim. Cut along the lines to remove the excess. Line up and secure your trim into place. Drill a hole and add a pop rivet to hold it all together. We hope that this has been helpful. This is something that might happen to you on a job site, and it's, uh, or if your bolts are wrong. I accidentally marked these holes incorrectly. I couldn't get my square in here because I was too close to this, too close to this. So I did a triangulation movement and I had little marks everywhere and I accidentally moved this hole an inch and a quarter over. We can't come in and drill right here because we're going to be too close to this hole. Really, the only, if we wanted to do that, we'd have to fill it with epoxy, probably drop a flush bolt in there and then come back in a couple of days and drill. Uh, we don't have time for that. Because of the girts on two foot center, what we're gonna do, and it's a non load bearing column, it's just a door jam. I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna slot these holes straight out, right? So it's almost gonna slip in there. Uh, if you're planning on doing something like that at your job site, it would probably be best to call us um, just to make sure. Uh, one that it's not load bearing and here it's going to work out just fine because we don't need the bottom of the column to be held in and out by the bottom bolts because of the number of girts in this thing so uh, we're going to do that but sometimes we all we all mess up so uh, nobody's immune to it so, uh, hopefully that helps if you have a bolt in the wrong spot or you need to do something yeah, sometimes shit happens what we've done we're, we're continuing our base trim we started base trim down there we started rake angle up here um, one thing, when you're uh, tying in your rake angle, the, uh, the eave struts aren't always perfectly up and down. You know, it's a bent, it's a bent deal, and these ones were slightly overbent. So we grabbed the level um, and held it on the outside face of the eave strut and pulled it over before we set the screw um, on the rake angle. So that rake angle will hold it in place. The wall panels will pull everything over. Um, like I said, it's barely overbent, um, but just so we have a good uh, starting point. So while these guys are finishing up their uh, base trim, once they get the base trim here, we're gonna start sheeting from this side uh, to the right. When you're doing panels, there's a lot of unstacking, restacking, and organizing. The way I like to do it is to start with the longest sheet in the stack at the bottom. And usually when they come in the, uh, in the, in the big bundles, it's, it's the opposite. So uh, since this wall's symmetrical, I'm making another stack over here so that when we go to pre-drill those, we're just gonna pick them up, set them on the saw horses, and, and they'll be set up. I'm doing a stack of 10, some guys will do more. These are 24 gauge panels, uh, cause it's, uh, uh, it's only a 50, 50 KSI tensile strength steel. Um, 
And this is the weathering seal. So this is going to rust up. That's the look that the customer is going for. Um, and you can see on some of the tops and stuff, they're already starting to rust where they've just gotten wet. So I'm going to pre-drill all these panels. I'm not going to pre-drill uh, the very tops. Um, so I will stop pre-drilling here. I will have to come back and do some extra drilling once the walls are in place, but we're only going to be coming down um, about a foot. In fact, I'll probably miss all these, but we don't pre-drill the top where it ties into the rake angle. Um, just because we're going to have to come back and trim this and trying to figure out the angle on those screws, it's just not worth it. Uh, they're going to be concealed behind trim and everything, so we're not looking for a perfectly straight line like we are on the outside. Another thing, at the top on the rake angle and on the eave struts, I'm going to use just one of our plain uh, metal fasteners, not a, uh, not a colored screw. I'm going to try to save those. Um, and we do send a bag of the, you know, 250 or 500, depending on the size. I think this job has 500 of those screws. So we're going to use those up there, and then along the, along the, you know, on the outside of the panel, we're going to use a Coco Brown screw. So it's going to look goofy for uh, a little while. It's going to have a whole bunch of brown dots all over it, but but the brown really matches the panel when it rusts. So doing our layout before I start drilling or before I start, you know, really getting ahead of myself. I'm going to check my girt spacing here. Our girts are on two foot centers. Of course, the girts toe down. So off, off, of, the, off of the steel line, we're two, four, six, and then we're down an inch and a quarter. However, because the steel, uh, because the panel uh, sits below the floor uh, by an inch and a quarter, we're going to have to further drop that. So I always like to take a field measurement. I'm going to come here. I know my first screw is going to be at two and a half inches. My next one is going to be just over 24 inches or two feet. I'm probably going to go 24. Nope, I'm going to go perfectly on 24. So because of the panel dropping down an inch and a quarter, uh, that's going to let us hold whole foot measurements all the way up. So pretty easy. These panels, they get pretty hot. Um, and they'll, they'll eat up your Sharpie, so always keep your cap on. Um, I'll probably go through three or four of these doing these, you know, doing the panels for the whole building. The other thing that's important to know is, is what the bottom of the panel is. So since we're sheeting from the left side to the right side, uh, we want this uh, bearing leg to be um, on the right side. That way, when the next panel comes over, it laps here. Uh, so this is our bottom. And if we accidentally drill them from the other side, on the, in this case, it'd be okay because we just save them and use them for the other wall. But here we're laid out correctly, two and a half inches. And then I'm going to work my way up every two foot, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. And I'm not going to do this one because this is going to be eave strut. So this is my end. Make a little E there so I know it's my end. At the ends of any panel, and that includes laps, we're going to have two screws in each low pan section. So a screw here, screw here, 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 and here. Same thing at the top. In the intermediate uh, parts of the panel, or for the intermediate girts, I should say, or purlins, whatever, um, we're going to only one screw per low section. And we're gonna offset that to the lapping side. So this uh, is the side where we'll place one screw. So we'll have a screw here, here, and here. Um, all the way up, and then of course at the top, two for each one. On laps, some guys won't pre-drill their, uh, their lapping edge, I always do. Um, and we've made sure, also very important, that we've made sure that this is perfectly flat. You can use a block of wood and a little sledge, to, to line everything up. Even on painted panels, all of the shears are an up shear, so uh, you shouldn't have any burrs or anything to scratch on. So um, on lap ribs, we're 20 inches on center. I'm gonna start my first one at two and a half. Same as the, uh, same as the, the base screw. And then I'm gonna come up every 20 inches. And instead of working 20 inches off this, I'm just gonna hold 20 inches. So 20, 40, just keeps the math easy, 60, 80, 100, 
120, 140, 160, 180, and I'm going to leave the lap screw out of here. Um, I'm not hitting my 20 inches, but we're going to have trim that comes down here, and I don't want to accidentally put a lap screw in that's going to interfere with the with the trim. All of our panel bundles have a cover sheet to protect the protect the panel. He made a you know just a real janky cut there, no big deal. But I like to take a little piece of panel and hold it so I can mark my screw holes. And a screw hole here, 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 and there. So I know that those are all lined up. And here we're only doing one screw. Now when you're, after you're done pre-drilling, it's important, on, the, on these panels it probably wouldn't make any difference because they're gonna get damaged, that's the idea, that they're gonna rust up. But on painted panels, after we screw the, or drill these, we don't wanna slide the panels back and forth. Uh, there'll be little shavings that come up in between the panels and it'll scratch the paint. So uh, when we remove these, we're gonna lift them straight up to, that way we don't accidentally scratch something. And on a building like this with all of these girts, normally, you know, you're skipping, you know, seven foot, you know, to the first girt, five foot a girt after that. But here with the purlins on two foot centers, or the girts, girts and purlins on two foot centers, uh, we got a lot of pre-drilling to do. Oh, actually another thing, the panels on the outside are gonna wanna dip down because they're not supported with the bearing leg. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that those panels don't drip or bend down as you're pushing the drill through, uh, cause it'll start to walk. As you get lower in the stack, the holes will start to come all the way out to the very edge. So uh, make sure you're supporting that properly. But I'm gonna to get to this and let you guys go. Last night, a couple of big surprise, a couple of few, few of the guys from the shop uh, decided to roll up and we were able to completely knock out uh, sheeting this end wall. And now we're getting into sheeting uh, the, the side wall here. Uh, the guys are uh, placing their trim and uh, we're gonna go over that in detail uh, a little bit, probably when we get over to the other wall and I do the other door. But uh, right now I wanted to bring up again uh, the steel line, where to start panels. I've had a, a lot of customers really ask a lot of questions and want a, a sheeting video. So I'm gonna hit steel line again, and then I'll talk a little bit about lap screws and stuff. Um, when it comes to starting a panel, right, we wanna start on what we call steel line and center of high rib. And the steel line, like I discussed in the other video, is the outside face of the steel. Where the panel meets the, meets the, uh, the framing, that is steel line, all the way down to the bottom, all the way up to the, to the rake or the eave. So when we, they start this, this next set of panels, that high rib or the lap side is gonna line up perfectly centered on this line. And that's what we want. That keeps our modulation the same so we can lay out our trim for our doors. This wall we started sheeting here and we moved this way, uh, keeping the bearing leg down and I, I think you saw a video of that, but the, underneath this, this leg runs all the way down and supports this lapping leg. Uh, so we started sheeting this way. We pre-drilled all, all of the holes, including the, the, the lap screw holes. And when we pre-drill that, we only pre-drill the lap screw holes on the lap side. Use the screw to finish the hole. 
on the other side. You'll never, if you, if you line them out, you'll never be able to get them to match up. Uh, at the bottom, two screws in each low pan section. And then uh, in the intermediate girts, and I know I already went over this, but in the intermediate girts, we just do one screw per pan section on the lap side. So we're, we're obviously not done sheeting this. Uh, before we can do the roof sheeting or do any trim work up there, we're gonna have to trim all of the panels. And there's a few ways to do that. We'll probably just use a Sawzall. Uh, I place the screws very close to the top, and since it's just a 112 pitch, there's not much panel overhanging, so it's gonna hold it real good. It's not gonna make as much noise. If you have like a 412 or a 612 in your cut, and you have, you know, six inches of panel flailing around up there, uh, it makes a lot of noise. It might be better to use a cutoff wheel. I really don't recommend cutting these on the ground um, because you're probably gonna have to trim them anyways uh, once you get to the top. So even if you cut them to the ground, if you have to raise it up, you still gotta come through and do it. And by doing it up in the air, it makes a real nice flat line and it, it makes it work so much faster. Uh, we also do two screws per pan section up at the top of the rake and then everything in, in the middle is just the one screw or the three screws per girt line uh, in each panel. Um, if there's lapping, this building's 18 feet tall, so we're about pushing that line where we would normally put a lap in there. On laps, you'll need to do two screws in the pan section too, uh, or per pan section. We're gonna get to sheeting this wall here in a few minutes. And again, when we start sheeting, we're gonna start with the, uh, with the steel line on the under on the uh, bearing leg rib. So actually they're gonna have to start sheeting from that corner because uh, this will be the first panel to go up. So we wanted to get some roof up, uh, that way we can stage roofing and everything. So that, that's what we're doing. I've made my layout marks here off center line. You can see this black mark. And those are on three foot centers going down the entire length of Perlin. I have Dom and Bear over there doing the same thing on the eave, except on the eave they're laying down a mastic tape. And the closure has a sticky backing on it as well. And those guys are making sure they don't stretch those. They're holding them exactly on one foot centers. And, uh, and closure on top of it. So we got a string line on the outside so that we know where we're holding our panel. Uh, this first panel that we put up is pretty critical. Uh, we wanna make sure that it's square and it's right on steel line. Uh, and it doesn't have any twists or anything in it because if it does, we're gonna have to take that out as we move along. This building has lap panels, so we have a 25 foot sheet here, or 24 and five inches or whatever. And then uh, the top sheet's a little bit shorter, about two feet. So a little over 40 feet, or 45 feet in total run per slope, and 45 on the other side. We have our sheets pre-drilled. Hopefully I didn't mess that up. And we're ready to throw a panel. On the back side of the building, we have a lift. Uh, this is where Dom and Bear were working, putting up mastic tape. And they're going to come up there and help me line this out. Say cheese, Justin. Cheese. And uh, yeah, these guys are going to want to slide that. You, you want to slide it up? Yep. Oh, hold it. We're gonna let them get theirs on. They'll check their measurement in the overhang on the end. I'm gonna grab one screw. Check my mod. Right into the front one. And then we can check our line. Looks pretty good. Another thing, when you're, these are gonna rust up. 
But you want to be real careful, especially on painted sheets, with all these shavings from the pre-drilling. You can really jack things up. I'm still going to be real careful sliding around on the roof because I'll get these shavings embedded in my pants. So I'm trying to avoid sliding as much as possible. Then I'll walk up, because it is kind of cold, where the mastic's been in the shade. So it's not going to want to stick real well. And when you pull this paper, it might stick to the paper and pull that mastic up, and that sucks. Like they got to stretch it down there. And I am definitely going to have to stretch here. So I'm going to show you guys a trick. So I know these panels need to modulate a little bit. You don't want to step on high ribs usually. But here... I'll put just a little bit of pressure. See where we wound up. I'm gonna have to start stretching. All right, so that's the way we do the roof. We're gonna keep on keeping on. I'm gonna let Justin get down so I can bring Garrett up here. And we're gonna stay up on top until it's done. So, rock and roll. So I've talked before in videos about purlin laps or girt laps and the necessity to pre-drill, um, especially when you're uh, doing sheet laps or your ridge caps, like the die form ridge caps. Um, what will happen is when you're coming through two purlins, the thread of the screw will actually start to bite into the panel or the upper panel uh, if it's a lap and start to drill in before it actually gets, uh, before it's finished drilling through the, uh, through the second purl. Um, so here, these are good. When I was up there, I did a bunch of pre-drilling for them, but I've left the guys up there and I've come back and I've noticed this is, this is a prime example of something that you wanna be real careful with. We're gonna be able to fix this. It's not gonna be a big deal, but, <clears throat> This was not pre-drilled. You can see there's no drill hole or anything and everybody thinks, oh, I can do it, I know what I'm doing. Well, you, you don't, you don't. And um, shit like this is aggravating, right? So the, the real problem that can happen if you're not pre-drilling, and here we're okay because the screws didn't break. You can see they're all janky and twisted, um, which means on the roof panel, we're gonna be prone to a leak, right? The screw's not in straight and we're lucky these didn't break. So we're gonna have to back these out. All, all it did is started to thread in here and then just shove this bottom flange down. So we're gonna pull those screws out and then drill, like I told them, and, uh, and fix that problem. But this is, this is you know, just you know, one of those things where you know, pre-drilling sucks, but you only really need to pre-drill at your laps, you know, so there's just a few. Just keep paying attention to it, and, you know, obviously, I think anybody can see the problem there, so. Uh, this is a good connection back behind us. This is, this is not good, so uh, pre-drill if you, if you can. And, um, you know, unfortunately, pre-drilling, it eats up a lot of screws. You know, this building has a lot of panels, a lot of girts, um, or a lot of, a lot of uh, drill bits, I mean. And, you know, we're probably gonna go through 25 uh, 964th drill bits on this job. 
but it's just it's the nature of the beast and you know you don't want to you don't want to have that i don't think it's a structural problem but it's certainly a problem that it's certainly something that could cause leaks later and it looks like hell so all right well how to Just starting here, uh, day eight. So we're, she we're trimming out the uh, the front garage doors. You saw how we did the uh, the FL55 cover trims. They just slide over. Um, I like, and there, there's two ways to do it. Uh, Aaron and I were kind of. He likes to do it one way. I like to do it another way. The way I like to do it is to hang the head trim first after covers are on. You know, if it's a garage door, this is a man door, so it doesn't get covers. After all that's done, get your drip edge on with a few pop rivets. And then from your drip edge down to your base trim, uh, get a measurement uh, from the bottom to the bottom. And you're going to want to cut about an eighth of an inch short, maybe a quarter, depending on where you have your reveal set for your panels or what you're trying to achieve. Um, and the reason I like to do it like that is because then I can take the J trim and cut a little tab on it. So we're going to cut this back and leave a tab. J trim is always run about six inches long. Again, sorry for the noise, but what that lets us do is come right up underneath and you can pretty much just, you know, leave it dangling or it makes it a lot, a lot more easy to level out. So now that piece is cut, these guys can pop rivet that in there and that's what I'm going to let them do. All right, uh, still on day eight here. Uh, we've, uh, behind us, uh, we have the, almost the entire front wall done. It's, it's been a bear. This is like the, the job that keeps on giving. The, the square footage makes it seem like it's uh, an easy one. Um, for you erectors out there, hey, pay attention to the amount of purlins and stuff in the building um, as it starts to add up a lot of pre-drilling. Um, but uh, there's a storm coming in and we're gonna be out here tomorrow, but we're trying to get uh, a good chunk of the roof on before uh, that happens. That way we can finish tying up our corners. Uh, but I thought it was a good time to talk about uh, a little bit of job site safety, some, some wind stuff to protect your panels and to keep stuff from blowing all over the place. Uh, right now it's a little bit calm, that's why we're out here shooting, but we've had some gusts around 30 miles an hour already today. Um, so we have a cover sheet, you know, which at the top of all of our panel bundles gets a cover sheet to protect them during transport and while you're moving them around. Um, and we have our last uh, sheet, our last long sheet for this end wall. Um, here and what we've done we've just placed some dunnage on top just to keep the corners down to stop wind from coming underneath of it this heavy iron you know we're not worried about the wind picking that up but uh, these uh, cover sheets and these trims you know we just don't want them blowing all over the, the, if the wind picks up it could blow these things into the building and it never makes for a happy customer since we're getting ready to do the roof I thought I'd show you what we're doing to raise the roof panels um, Here's just a cover sheet. We just have some wood on it to hold it down. And because we're getting ready to fly these panels up to the roof, probably the most dangerous thing you can deal with on a job is roofing when it's windy. Um, the wind down here is gonna be lower than it's gonna be up there. Uh, so uh, we got a clamp on each end of the panels and we've also got them strapped just in case the whole stack wants to pick up. I don't think that's much of a concern with how heavy this is, but when we start eating through the, through the stack, it's gonna get a lot lighter and we could actually lose the whole stack up there. And with guys walking around carrying panels, um, it doesn't look like a lot, but the wind it will rip these things right out of your hand and not even a big wind, you know, just a, a, a surprise 50 mile an hour gust, you could lose a sheet. So. Um, when we're up there carrying them, we're going to be carrying them uh, away from the wind. So if the wind picks up, it's blowing away from us. And uh, we'll have to unclamp and reclamp every time we pull a sheet. And we'll have to uh, take the straps off each and every time. It'd be nice if it was, be nice if it was uh, as, as pleasant of weather that we've been lucky with for the last week. But uh, today, it's, that's not the deal. It's, it's calm right now. but. Uh, we know we're expecting some pretty high gusts uh, going into this evening. So this is the last bundle of sheets that has to go up. Then we just got to tie in our corners, the ends of the panels. And we got to trim these rakes and maybe one day we'll be out of here. But it's not a 
it's not a bad place to be stuck a few extra days than you were expecting, so thank you. Uh, it's day nine, the end of day nine. That's a wrap. We've we've knocked the building out. Uh, there's still a little bit of noise. Hopefully the audio is okay. But uh, just tightening up some closures over there. Uh, the guys are doing that. It's beer time for me. Yeah, a few days longer than we thought. There's a lot of purlins on this thing. They got to wipe down the the outside of the panel with a little bit of mi mineral spirits. Uh, that'll get the, the rust reaction happening a little bit faster. They have that oil coating on them. So it was kind of nice working with panels where we're not worried about scratch and paint. All in all, you know, just, just a fantastic job. What a great place to be. Isn't it nice to be out of cell, cell service for a week? So if I missed your calls or I missed your emails, sorry about that. Um, I will be back in tomorrow on Monday. Uh, Garrett and Aaron and Bear, Holy smokes, you guys killed it. The property owner, owners, uh, David and Belinda, holy smokes, you guys are so nice. They fed me, the, us, all the guys, they put us up for the whole week. Um, home cooked meals and breakfast every day and Belinda was kind enough to bring lunch every single day. Um, and, my, and my buddy Todd Colvin, uh, who's the caretaker here at the ranch. It's, uh, it's fun to work for friends and, and, and family and, and it's just really nice that they let us come out and do this. We'll see, we'll see what it looks like in, a, in about six months or something, but it's gonna be really cool. If you have any questions, give us a call. We're always trying to help. And, and Aaron, uh, our trim guy, the, the guy that really pulled through for us here, uh, he's our customer service rep. So um, if you have any problems putting yours up or, or if you're just working on somebody else's building, Give us a call. Aaron or myself or Ryan or Tyler can jump on the phone with you and help you troubleshoot and maybe send you to some of these videos. So, all right, until the next time, we'll see you. Bye.